Forget the clubs. Think about unemployed people. If you're unemployed, you're actually, your presence in the market is affecting the probability of other unemployed to find a job. Okay, so welcome back. Um, today we'll do the first serious model of the labor market uh, in the search and matching perspective. I'd like to give you a lot of sort of inside information about how this model sort of works and it's, uh, for me, it's a little bit like the solo model of macroeconomics. It's, the, it's like the rock foundation of what we do in, uh, in macro and labor. And I think it's uh, an extremely important starting point. And I think I've taught this course in many different ways. And this time I'm gonna try to teach, teach it the, way, the traditional way, which starts with this um, almost like a macroeconomic model, but it has these, um, these differences that we have with other macro models, which is the search and matching friction, the fact that the labor market doesn't work like, like the Marshallian labor demand and supply framework that we talked about last week or two weeks ago. Okay, so we'll start with the summary of the last session just to remind you, those of you who didn't come last time, um, I'd like to get your names and email addresses at some point and please sign up for the Moodle anyway. Um, maybe you've already been on there. Um, so today I'm gonna, because I would give a lot of information uh, through the Moodle website. Um, we're going to talk about the last session very briefly to remind you some, some key things. Thomas, you saw Thomas already in the first section and he's already given you some of the introductory concepts. Uh, we'll introduce the Pizzardis model. I'll give you some building blocks that go into it, some which you already know. Um, the key aspect of the, the Pizzardis model for us today is the, is the value um, of a job. The value of a job and the value of the job from the perspective of the worker and the value of the job from the perspective of the employer. And the reason why these have value is because they're not easy to get. You have to match to get them. And that's the key insight um, that carries forward into next week and the week after next and the rest of the course. Now, in these types of situations, the wage gets determined um, in some, in, according to some mechanism that we have to specify. So it's not, if we don't have this, we don't have supply and demand, then something has to tell us where the wage is coming from. And that's what um, the Pissarides model is so good at doing. It just gives us a very easy way of thinking about um, the way the wage is determined. And we can perhaps criticize it, we can extend it, um, and ask uh, what, what do we learn from it. We don't learn a lot of interesting things we'll see uh, today. And then I'll give you a little diagrammatic exposition, um, sort of like, like supply and demand. Pissarides, the Pissarides model has a, kind of a supply curve and kind of a demand curve that come together to, to determine two endogenous variables that are very important. So once you learn how to use this model, you can learn it, you can use it, learn to use it uh, for lots of different questions, like asking about labor market reforms or what happens if you make unions stronger or weaker, make employers uh, stronger or weaker, make, make, um, make it more comfortable to search for jobs, uh, to be unemployed versus uh, not having a job, how to make it more expensive to post a vacancy. So that's a key, a key variable in this model is the stock of vacancies, the stock of open, unfilled positions that our workers could get um, if they could find them. And then we'll do some comparative statics. That's kind of the, this model is a model for the long run. Like the solo model, it's for the long run, which means I'm not going to use this to predict unemployment next month in Germany. It may go up, may go down, we don't know. But if you want to ask what's going to happen in Germany over the next five to ten years, this is the way to, to do it. This is a starting point. And again, next week we'll do a fancier version of this, and then we'll do a perhaps even a fancier version of that, uh, and then we'll ask more questions about the, the nuts and bolts. It's like a, when you buy a car, um, you usually want to open the motor hood and look under the hood and see what's in there. Um, in this particular Pizzeries model, a lot of the, the motor is not visible. Okay, so one of the most important things we'll talk about today is the matching function and we'll get into how that works. Okay, so last time we did the central role of labor markets, we did uh, these three concepts which are important. Three states of the labor market. You can think of more states, but they're not really relevant for us. In fact, for today, we're going to focus on employment and unemployment. So either you've got a job or you don't have a job. So we're restricting our attention to the, to the, to the 
fraction of people that are in the labor force in the sense of the International Labor Office. So they're looking for work. They've done something in the past week or month to, um, to look for a job, but were not successful, successful, so they would be unemployed. And if they have a job, they're employed. Okay, we looked at the ways of looking at the labor market, the bathtub, we'll come back to that. Thinking about unemployment as an asset, um, in the sense that um, it may be, um, there's always a probability of getting something, getting an offer, in a model where you can't immediately locate um, job harvers, and there may be even a, uh, maybe even an option value of not taking the first job offer. We, don't, we won't see that in this case yet, but there's always this issue of uh, holding out for a better option. Okay, and that's, an, that's something that we have to, labor economics, we have to think hard about. Sometimes the options aren't very good, but if they exist at all, we have to take them seriously. And then we also talked about, I think Thomas may have mentioned also, the, the properties of this, um, of this sort of a black box that we'll use extensively today. Okay, so last time we, we, looked, we looked at unemployment, we re remind ourselves that it's the ILO definition. So again, we have to distinguish between people who um, voluntarily do not participate in the labor market, those people are not in, in our ILO definition. You have to be doing something. You may be discouraged, and that discouragement may also have reasons. And I'm not going to deny that these uh, type of individuals exist, but right now we're going to look at people who are actually looking, maybe with a lot of effort, maybe with less effort, and still don't have work. Okay, and we, again, we, we noted that there, the classic way of looking at this would be a supply and demand equation, um, a supply equation, demand equation, a supply and demand curve, and looking at the at uh, impediments to wages falling or rising to clear the market. Okay, so, you know, for a lot of questions, that's good enough. It's also good enough uh, for some people to think about some macroeconomic phenomena. Um, maybe you think wages are rigid because of labor market institutions, or maybe you think they're rigid because there's uh, just an inherent uh, timing involved. Think of, think of the Calvo mechanism in macroeconomics. But these things may not be satisfactory in all cases. Okay, so if we think about the, the frictional approach, we'd like to think of unemployment and employment as being kind of a mix of um, kind of the accumulation of a lot of, of opportunities or lack of opportunities that you've had. And um, therefore, it follows immediately that unemployment is never a really entirely voluntary phenomenon. There's going to be some, there's going to be some aspect in which people are unemployed or always a little bit unhappy, um, but they may be, may be having some sort of intelligent calculus, uh, like Robert Lucas said in the last lecture, that maybe if you, um, you're not entirely happy, but you, you would rather do this than, than take the, the first job that you can get. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a tricky question, because you talk to unemployed people, they react sometimes in very different ways, right? And there's a, um, and if you look at the data, you see that um, it doesn't look like I mean, the, the, the rises in unemployment are quite drastic. Okay, this is the United States, but Germany looks very similar. This doesn't look like a, um, the stochastic process that we, we studied in, uh, in Yama, for example. Okay, the rises in unemployment are quite violent. They occur during the recessions, obviously. And then the recovery is, look at the angle uh, over time. We have basically since 1949, we've got monthly unemployment in the United States. You can see the rises are quite sharp. They happen almost occur in, within 6 uh, to 12 months, um, and then they start fall. Then the unemployment rate starts falling at a rather slow rate, and the best example would be the, the Great Recession. Okay, so you know, look at the angle over, that angle kind of measures the, the reduction in unemployment over time in a normal recovery. You might say, well, the American economy isn't recovering as strongly, but I would actually argue that the drop in unemployment in the past re recovery has been sharper or more steep than in many of the recessions preceding it. So in other words, these things take time. It, it's easy to kick someone out of, out of a job, but it may be hard to, for that person to locate another one. And this is what is kind of at the center of the, uh, of the discussion this whole semester, okay? That it just takes time, um, and it may be because people are choosy, it may be because companies are choosy, Maybe uh, there's just some sort of like this like bathtub where you're working your way through trying to locate the options that are available. And this is a, a picture I showed last time, which um, from um, Vincent Sturck at the LSE, at the, um, LSE 
who basically shows, or UCL, I think it's UCL actually, showing the, that if you take the trend out, you get this really nice negative relationship between unemployment relative to trend and vacancies relative to trend. And you can also have movements off, off the, the trend. So you can look at this, the last few dots, the red dots indicate that something may have changed in the United States in the most recent uh, recession, okay? And again, a lot of what that has to do with is people who have been unemployed for a long time. So the, the, the distinguishing feature of the most recent recession in the United States, not so much in Germany, but in the United States, is that a lot of people lost their jobs in 2008 and 9 and have not been, been very uh, good at finding them again. Okay, so this is a really fascinating. This is the fraction of people who have been unemployed in the United States for more than 27 weeks, which is considered, in the U.S., considered long-term unemployment. In the European OECD, it's usually thought of as 52 weeks or more. So they're different standards. Okay, so what concepts are we talking about like last time? We're going to have, we're going to think about incomplete information. People are kind of searching. Uh, for some reason, the jobs and the vacancies the, the, the vacancies and the unemployed searchers don't come together. Uh, last time we had this very simple accounting uh, setup that I'm going to develop very deeply today, uh, and even more so next week. Think of the inflow rate coming out of the job. So you have the stock of employment, people losing their jobs, or people separating from their jobs. We talk about a separation rate. Um, and then the Pissarides model will actually make that um, very clear. It's a it's no one's to blame for the job loss. It's just a, it's, it's a random event. And later we'll talk about reasons why workers and firms may separate. It may obviously be the, the firm's decision or it may also be the worker's decision. And, but the flow right now is just um, uh, going to be an exogenous rate S. Okay? And F is the, the flow of workers out of unemployment into the other state. And the two-state model, that would be into employment. And there is quite easy. This is what I tried to drive on the board last time. And um, again, if we let L bar, L bar is the, is the exogenous um, labor force. So shutting down the, the exits from the labor force into non-participation just for the moment. Okay? Then basically you have these two states and it's a race. It's like the bathtub. So you have water coming into the bathtub and you have water going out of the bathtub. And the two rates are depending on the the sizes of their respective stocks. And when the, the bathtub um, stops changing in the level, when you, the level of water in the bathtub stops changing, basically you've reached something like a, um, we'll call it a steady state equilibrium or steady state uh, situation. It's difficult, we have to be careful with our language because equilibrium usually implies some sort of behavior and we haven't done any behavior yet. We're just going to describe what happens when the, the stock is, is not changing. Okay, so we, again, you take this simple um, definition uh, and then write down the difference equation that would describe the inflows and the outflows. It's basically um, saying the change in the unemployment um, rate and then moving into the next period, we'll call that UT plus one, is simply to the previous period plus the inflows into unemployment as normalized on the labor force, minus the outflows out of the unemployment stock. Okay, so we end up getting this nice formula, which uh, we wrote last time and Thomas probably already talked about. So this is something you should always keep in the back of your head. Uh, in a two-state model, you can always write the unemployment rate as a, as a ratio of an inflow rate and some sort of, uh, if you like, incidence rate on, in the denominator, or call it the outflow plus the inflow rate. Um, it's a very nice uh, way to organize your thoughts. We, we move on to more complicated models. This will always come, um, come up. So again, the picture of the bathtub. The Pissarides model will basically try to, to model the bathtub as the interaction of unemployed people and firms that have exactly one job to offer. Okay, and so this is a really, this is, uh, I'm gonna, Going to, I'm going to write down the model in a second, but I just want you to think of this. Now we've got, uh, and this is what we call undirected uh, search. Basically, the, the workers and the firms are in there, and they're just bouncing off each other like Brownian motion. That's the first cut, because eventually people will be able to choose where they go, where you go in the bathtub, or what you, what you do to get out of the bathtub, whether you can change your behavior. But it already goes to capturing what, what Friedman said when he tried to describe the natural rate of unemployment about 50 years ago. So this is an old idea, but it's now got this new clothing. Okay, so Milton Friedman talked about the, he said it's not, 
may not be adequate to think about Walras because unemployment uh, has this uh, structural aspect. There may be market imperfections. Information may not be clear. There may be, it may be costly. Okay? So um, as soon as you admit that, okay, that insight, then it follows naturally that having a job in a world with frictions actually has value of itself. And actually, you can also value the, the ability to find a job in the future. Okay, so again, you want, I want you to understand the, the insight of, of, of Pissarides and his simple model that we're going to do today is basically is deriving from Lucas's statement in 1978. Okay, so he was saying it's really kind of a, it's misleading, possibly in disingenuous to say that everyone who's unemployed is voluntarily unemployed or everyone who's unemployed is involuntarily unemployed. His notion was it's kind of a mix of both. And it depends on the situation of the worker. It depends on that worker's uh, opportunities. Okay, and if, if, you're, if you're in this sort of imperfect world with search frictions, um, if you have a job in the hand, uh, it's very valuable because if you lose that job, you're going to be out for some time because of the frictions. Okay, so again, my, my objective today is to use the Pissarides model. Has anyone seen this model already? Can I just ask? Has anyone had this model? Maybe in macro with other people? Okay. Did you have it with Lutz, Bellman? Uh, no, I did not. Okay, so you, someone completely different. That's fine. Okay, so we'll, you know, if you get bored, let me know. If you have a question, whatever. Okay, so the, um, yeah, so you might have had it with, with Professor Weinke. Um, right, so the, this is a great way to get started. The solo model was also a huge simplification. The, the key thing in macro when you were an undergraduate was to learn about the production function. You use that to think about accumulation. Stocks versus gross investment, net of depreciation. It's the same idea here. You have, a, you have a stock of unemployment, you have increments to unemployment coming from inflows, and you have exits from unemployment uh, coming from successful jobs, job search. This is the first, the first cut. So this is kind of a general equilibrium model, but it doesn't have all the flavor that we like to assign to general equilibrium. It doesn't involve consumers maximizing utility. Um, but it has firms trying to do the best they can, and if, they, if there's a deviation from um, sort of a zero profit condition, firms will activate and try to look for workers, and workers also get to bargain when they're in a job, they can actually f sort of push back, and you'll see in a second what that means. Okay? So the unemployment results naturally in this model because of the frictions. There's a, there's, the faucet is open. Okay? You're taking a bath, there's water coming in, and the, the amount of water that comes in depends on how much water is in the tank above the house. Okay, so the amount of, it's, it's kind of a, I mean, there's a natural uh, analogy of thinking about this with, um, again, assuming that the rate of inflow is constant, that it buys you a lot. And uh, maybe in the section, but certainly next week, we'll talk about some of the data that says that this inflow rate is actually very stable. Even in Germany, when you think of all this ter the the terrible problems they had after unification um, and how things have gotten better over time, this uh, inflow rate into unemployment is rather stable. Okay, it moves a little bit, and maybe a little bit is enough to make the, the, the rate move a lot. But uh, if you try to explain that first, you're, you're going to be chewing a lot. But explaining the outflows as a fraction of unemployment is easier, econometrically speaking. Okay, so we'll go there right now and think about that. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. No, I'm talking about the, 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 the rates of inflow and outflow, not the, yes. the level, right? So little, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yes. So I'm, I mean, the, the period of following unification, German unemployment rate, rate rose in both parts of Germany. It rose in West Germany uh, because of the, for lots of reasons, we can talk about them, um, but especially after 1993. And East Germany, it rose because of, of unification, because of the, the collapse of the socialist enterprises. They didn't have any markets and they just, had to get rid of people. I mean, that was kind of the, the mandate of the Troy and was to re reorganize those as quickly as possible. So it led to a lot of short-term unemployment. So what I'm trying to say is that, that uh, those kind of flow changes are rare compared to what we normally observe over the business cycle. Okay. Especially in, I mean, Germany is kind of special because of unification. If you look at the United States, for example, the Great Recession was kind of a, a case where the inflow rate rose a little bit. Um, and was elevated for some time, but if you look at the most recent 50 years, 
most of the action seems to be coming from F, from the alpha rate. OK, so let's remind ourselves about this uh, matching function. So this is like the production function um, in uh, growth theory. Okay, it's supposed to stand for something that we're not going to try to understand immediately, but it captures a lot of regularities. Okay, so remember, production function says capital and labor can be um, sort of put together with, by, by firms to create output that they can sell to individuals. That's kind of a, an abstraction. Okay, so this abstraction um, has been successfully applied to thinking about two stocks in the labor market. One is the stock of unemployed, and the other is the stock of vacancies. And that's the, um, when I was doing my um, um, research in the 1990s, I did a lot of econometric studies of the stability of this, of this relationship over time. And it, it is pretty stable. There's some stuff we can't explain. But if you raise unemployment in any economy, the outflows out of unemployment actually rise. It sounds a bit paradoxical, but it's true. Because some people becoming unemployed actually find a job very quickly. Okay, and, and, and an abstraction, uh, you'd think, well, you know, maybe they're different. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe the abstraction is just too, is too, um, is too glib, okay? but it's a good first approximation. And the idea would be that the, that the stock of unemployment actually affects the rate of outflow out of the uh, stock of unemployment. And, of course, the stock of vacancies has a positive has a positive effect on the rate of outflow out of unemployment as well. Okay, so those are kind of things we can show with data. We can look at data on German uh, Arbeits, uh, Amtsbezirke, like, or Arbeitsagentur uh, Bezirke. They're sort of like, you know, uh, regional elements that are sort of used by the, the, the Bundesagentur für Arbeit, the, the German Employment Agency, to do their accounting. So they can measure vacancies at these very local levels. And they can basically show, you can show data, you can look at time, time series of, of the UK or the United States that um, if you increase the stock of unemployment, the outflow increases. Okay? And the question is, you know, uh, what's going on there? Well, again, just accept, accept the modeling strategy first. Just like when you put more capital into the production function, you get more output. Um, if you put more labor into the production function, you get more output. It's going to depend on the relationship between the two. It's going to depend on the ratio of capital to labor. It's the same idea in the job uh, matching approach. What matters is the ratio of the two arguments. Okay, so if you assume constant returns to scale, like Thomas probably already talked about, it just means we we're assuming that if you scale up the two arguments by some constant that's positive, you're going to scale up the output by a positive factor. Okay, so that's, the, that's just a simple, you know, you'd say almost innocuous assumption. What does it mean? It means like a city like Berlin and a city like uh, Saarbrücken, uh, in the assumption, in the abstraction, would have the same ability to place workers as a fraction of the unemployed, as a fraction of the vacancies, regardless of the size. There are no advantages, per se, to being in Berlin versus in Saarbrücken. If you could scale up Saarbrücken to be the size, same size as Berlin, the rates that you can, you can derive, the matching rate um, of outflow per unit of vacancy, or the, the matching rate for, for unemployed as a fraction of, of unemployed persons, would be the, would be the same. Okay, so it's kind of, you might say it's a heroic assumption. Um, there's some, some folks who believe that there are increasing returns to scale, so big, big cities are just inherently better at, at matching workers. Um, the data are not so clear on that. Uh, and of course, you might also say there's, there's going to be just massive congestion. If you, have, if you have a big city, there's just so many people, they could be congesting each other. These are things that we're going to kind of rule out. So the, the, the Pissarides sort of cut, you know, cut through the, the fog and said, we're going to assume constant returns just to see what happens. And I'm going to do the same thing with you right now. So if L bar is the, is the labor force, I can divide that matching function by L bar, and I can write that same function as a function of the unemployment rate and the vacancy rate as a fraction of the labor force. Okay? That's the scaling advantage of constant returns to scale. Just like in growth theory, per capita GDP doesn't depend on how many people you have. It depends on how much capital per capita or per capital per worker. Okay, so that's a, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a very, very powerful assumption. And a lot of people have come back to this and revisited it. Like as I said, um, 
it's not clear which way it goes. So let's go with the constant returns of scale assumption first and see where it takes us. Okay, so um, if you're willing to make that assumption um, and that yellow blotch is there for a reason, so I want you to keep your eye on the, on the first point first. If you take the assumption of constant returns, um, you can basically write the finding rate for an unemployed worker. So you're in the bathtub, you've got all these you people around you, and again, U is not normalized by the labor force yet. Okay, if I divide that X by U, I end up any, I'm able to write the, the rate of job finding from the perspective of an unemployed person as simply a fraction, um, as a function of V divided by U. Okay, so it's a, it's a function of the vacancy unemployment rate. We're gonna have a special name for that. We're gonna call it theta. And you'll see that you probably saw it last week. This theta is, is a, in a constant returns world, in this model, is going to be a sufficient statistic for tightness in the labor market. So when V divided by U is high, labor markets are tight, and it's easy for workers to find jobs. It's going to be hard for firms to find workers. So if, you, if you've been reading the newspaper, Berlin is kind of a high theta place right now. It's a really exciting place to be if you're young, dynamic, have some, you know, have, have you desire to work, look for a job. It's really easy to find jobs. Now, this is just a measurement. We're going to have to try to explain why theta is high or low, and that's the whole point of the Pizzeri's model. We're going to endogenize theta. But first, I want you to understand that theta is a key uh, variable of interest in this model. Theta. Okay, we will not refer to theta as anything else in this whole course. Theta is the... the measure of labor market tightness, the ratio of vacancies to unemployment. So in a constant returns world, that's the same thing as saying the ratio of the vacancy rate to the unemployment rate, little v to little u. Duh, right? It's easy. It's important. It's a scale-free economy. In this, in this Pissarides world, we're going to be dealing with this, and maybe we can offer some criticisms later. It's a sufficient statistic for what we call job market tightness. And again, looking at, looking at Germany right now, it's, the employers are complaining. Why are they complaining? They can't find any workers. What does that mean? They post a vacancy, and they can't fill it. I post a vacancy from, for people to work for me, can't fill them. Okay? I have lots of heavy jobs. Nobody wants them. Okay? Why is that? Because everyone else is looking. And maybe most unemployed people aren't unemployed anymore. Maybe they have jobs. Okay, remember, you can only be unemployed or working in this model. Okay, so um, you can turn the model on its head and say the vacancy filling rate is just kind of a reflection of the situation from the worker's perspective. Since X is the same for workers and firms, uh, that it turns out that the, the, the vac we use the symbol Q for the vacancy filling rate from the perspective of the firm. The firm posts a vacancy. What is the probability, since all these firms are, are going to be a, the same in this model, uh, what is the probability of the firm getting... Uh, a placement in a unit of period of time. That's just going to be Q, and Q is also a function of theta. Just take X and divide by a V, use the constant returns property, and then you get this sufficient statistic. That's, it's, just a, it's very simple, but it's actually much more subtle than you think, because that derivative, um, the derivative of, of little Q is negative. Okay, so the probability of a firm being able to place its vacancy within a unit time, um, given theta, is going to be falling in theta. The same thing is for F. It's going to, for the worker's perspective, it's great to have a high theta because it means they can, they have their pick of the litter. They can just get it, take, you know, they get five job offers and they can just flip a coin or go to the, in in a, in a more complicated world, they could actually go to the one that pays the best wage or has the most attractive working conditions. In Pizzeri's model, everything's the same. Okay, so that is the key identity that you should all look at right now with the yellow. That's really important. The yellow mark says that F and Q are inextricably linked. Okay, great, great exam question. It's a throwaway. It's easy to get. For a given X, that has to be the case if you have constant returns to scale. I tell you what F is. You can tell me what Q is if you know what theta is. Okay, so Q is just F divided by theta. If I tell you what uh, theta is and you know what Q is, you can tell me right off the bat, right off the bat, 
what f is. Okay, there's no, it's, it's, it's by construction. And that means constant returns plus a little bit of algebraic manipulation. So this is a really important thing. We'll come back to that. So you can see that, I mean, kind of in the way that Marx thought about it but didn't use the Pissarides model, there's this inherent conflict in the labor market between capital and labor. And in this model, you don't have any capital, but you have this conflict between the employers and the employees. So if I'm doing OK, I'm a worker, my, high, my theta in my market is high, then the guys trying to find people like me are going to be facing a high theta, and that's bad for them. Okay, so you have this inherent, I mean, that, that, that's true. I and mean, right now, workers have a, have a good situation in Berlin. You might say other wages aren't high enough. That can, we can look at that. We'll look at it in a second, because this is just a partial equilibrium uh, perspective. But it also means that uh, firms are going to be grumbling. I can't, I can't find any workers. And it's exactly what we hear today. Can't find any apprentices. Can't find any to work for me. So this is a key insight of this model. So I can't stress this enough. If you want to learn something in this course, you want to learn that the matching function is about a property of labor markets with search and matching frictions, um, which involves externalities. Okay, it's a non-marketed effect that my behavior has on other agents in the economy. We call that an externality in economics. Like if I pollute the air and I don't pay for it, other people have to breathe it. Or if I actually, if I'm well educated, and I talk to people that may give them positive benefits, and they don't pay me for it, those are called externalities. In the search and matching framework, it's all about that, and it's because we're in this bathtub, and we don't know this, but our effect on other people is kind of uh, non-zero. So if you go into a club, and you're looking, you know, you're looking for a guy. Uh, <laughs> It's going to depend on how many other guys are in the, in the, in the club. Even if it's really dark, it's also going to be how many other people are looking for a guy. OK? That's, that's the key thing. That's what, that's what the whole model is about. Search externalities. OK? Agents are atomistic. They don't perceive this effect. And I just saw a paper recently that talks about when a firm is big enough to feel the effect, they can actually manipulate it. But right now, everyone's very small. You're atomistic. You're in this bathtub swimming around. You're looking for somebody. Okay, but being in there means you affect other people's success probabilities. Okay, so again, forget the clubs. Think about unemployed people. If you're unemployed, you're actually, your presence in the market is affecting the probability of other unemployed to find a job. Verdrängungseffekt, if you like, in German. Okay, you're also enhancing the chances that some firm out there in the bathtub will find you. Okay, so that's a positive effect. And those are effects that are not mediated by any market in this particular model. There are no brokers in this model. There are no, there are no people like uh, hooking you up with uh, Instaff or some company or something. There are just platforms. This is another model you could think about. Okay? So an increase in the number of, of you unemployed people will affect the success probability of not only the other unemployed, but you'll also affect the success probability of other firms. And that's what we call an externality. And in an externality, with a market with an externalities, you have an obvious question that every good economist asks, are we doing the best we can? Could we do better? Could we somehow manipulate the market as a central planner or as an Arbeitsagentur? Can we do something to help maybe move the economy to a better position? Okay, and that's kind of what we'll be, I mean, if you're interested in this, uh, please read the Pissarides reading. Um, uh, look at some of the other chapters. He actually talks about this explicitly. We won't talk about it yet. But it's generally the case when you have these types of imperfect markets or market failure, because of the friction, you have this market failure um, in some sense, um, then there may be some improvement possible from the decentralized uh, outcome. OK, any questions about that? So you have, you've, probably seen, you've seen this before. So let's talk about the Pissarides model. I'll give you some notation first. I should give you a warning. This, is a, this model has a, is, it's like going into a pool. with You don't know how deep it is. So if you keep swimming, you're looking for the bottom, you may just keep on going. Uh, one of the most important limitations of this model is that in its simple form, we're not going to look at dynamics. We're going to, look at, we're going to compare steady states. So we're going to compare the situation before and after. We're not going to talk about how we got there. If you do macro, you know that's kind of interesting too. But if you do that, it's much harder. And the gain does not justify the cost at this point. 
I like to think of this as kind of the solo model of, of labor economics, right? This is a, so we're going to consider the steady state uh, exclusively. We'll be comparing steady states throughout the, the lecture. So I'm going to define four states of the labor market. You know them already, depending on whether you're a firm, whether you're a worker. Okay, so if you're a firm, you can either have a worker in hand. That's going to be J, capital J. That's going to be the asset value of being in the state I have a worker working for me right now. Okay, you could also not have a worker, and if you're in the market, that means that you're, you've got, you're, you're posting a vacancy. What else can you be doing? So if you're looking for a worker, um, you post a vacancy, and that's going to give you value V. Think of these as capital, vas as capital asset values, just like Lucas talked about in the, in the quotation I showed you earlier. Okay? And on the other side of the market, you've got workers. If a worker has a, has a job, the worker is um, in good, you know, kind of in better shape than she would be if she were unemployed. And if she were unemployed, she has you. So those, we're going to be treating those asset values, those, those state valuations, as if they were assets. Okay? Because in this world with frictions, you can, you can, your asset, the, the fact that you have the asset can be taken away from you by random events. So your firm goes bankrupt, you lose the job. Okay? Um, if you're a firm, the, firm, the worker leaves, you, you, you have to go into a vacancy posting mode. Okay? So those, those four states are important. And again, we're, we're trying to start easy, so we're going to do what Pissarides uh, did in his seminal papers in the 80s. I'm, I'm going to assume away risk aversion. You can put it in. It doesn't change much. It changes a little bit on the on the formation of wages and the rest, but we can, we can deal with that maybe even uh, later on in the course. But right now we're going to assume risk neutrality. Okay, so workers basically are trying to maximize, if you like, the, the value of their lifetime participation in the, labor, in the labor market. The same thing as firms. Firms are trying to maximize expected profits. Okay, and th the assumptions that we're making here are not uh, so first order problematic because in fact, markets adjust very rapidly. So the, the, um, the reason why unemployment rises so fast uh, in these recessions is usually a very small deviation of, of S and especially F from their long run values. Okay? And usually this, this gap is closed quickly, meaning the unemployment rate stops changing. So we're going to take that as a first approximation. So I always tell people, um, because Pissarides sharing with Peter Diamond and uh, Dale Mortensen, they got the Nobel Prize for this model. It has to have something. I mean, there's the judgment of a lot of people. If you know something about the way the Nobel Prize selects its prize laureates, it's pretty complicated. So they invite a lot of people to talk, and a lot of people don't get it. So there's a, there's some, there's a lot of interesting juiciness in this model. Okay, so I'm going to try to convey that to you right now. Okay, so we're going to think about this. This is a one-person, one-firm setup. We're going to assume that workers produce at constant returns to scale with the firm. So that means that it doesn't matter that we're making this one person, one firm assumption because if you put, all, if you put 10 firms and 10 workers together, you would get exactly 10 times the, the result. There's no strategic reason for firms to, to bunch up at this moment. As I said before, there's some interesting work being done on market power. But right now, we're going to keep it simple just to understand uh, how far we can get with this with this uh, assumption. So workers are identical ex ante. The only reason they're different is if they have a job. If they don't have a job, they're unemployed. Okay? And the value of, of uh, unemployment is B. Okay? This could be an unemployment benefit. It could be the value of their free time. It could be many, many different things. Okay? So it's just going to be this monetized value of being unemployed. It could be, we're going to think of this as being significantly less than W, and the equilibrium will be less than W. Firms, when they employ a worker, pay them a wage. And because all workers ex ante have the same productivity with the firms, that means there's probably not much reason to think the firms will be paying different wages to different workers. And that can be confirmed in this model. So the model next week has firms earning different, paying workers different wages according to their productivity. The Pissarese model is really simple. Okay, and again, I'm, you may think this is Mickey Mouse, but this is um, the, 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 the knowledge that a model conveys is the intuition as well as the reasons why you don't want to take the model too seriously. Okay, so it's like, a, it's like putting on glasses. What do you want to look at? 
uh, put on the right glasses, right? If you want to look at the sun, you probably want to put on some sunglasses. You probably want to have some pretty special sunglasses. And if you want to read, you better have reading glasses on. So it's kind of a, the way I think of a model is a way of understanding a very, very complicated reality. It's, I think that's the way most economists uh, tend to think about this. So the Pizzeridi's genius was to put a Nash bargain into this setup. A lot of people have thought about this before. Peter Diamond and other people have thought about this, but um, the notion of bargaining over the wage upon meeting, so bumping into someone in the bathtub and then suddenly saying, hey, if I walk away from you, I've, I'm losing something. So the, the encounter in the club is actually valuable because it gives us a chance to, to do something better than being unemployed. Okay, and then how does that value show up? So the value is the value of the match. There's a surplus, we call it a surplus in economics. And it's because of the frictions, that the surplus is, you know, you just can't get this all the time. You have to run into somebody. And that's why the, the analogy is so clever. Um, you know, um, it's so interesting to think about other, you know, applications in, in life where this, this search paradigm works. It certainly works in the labor market. So we're gonna use the Nash concept for the wage. So the wage is simply a bargain between workers and firms. And the worker has a threat point. And the threat point is what is the value of walking away from this encounter? And what is that? What is the value of walking away? Being unemployed. Okay, so it's not great. Okay, so it's, this, the firm has the same issue. The firm has posted a vacancy. It's paying a cost to do that. It's searching for the worker. And if it runs into a worker, all the workers are the same. I don't have to discriminate. I'm just going to add a yes or no. And if I say no, I'm going to be back into the vacancy posting mode again. And that has a, a that's inferior to the value of somehow split, <laughs> splitting some of the surplus with this worker. That's the idea. Just a basic application of the, mash, the Nash um, idea in a, in a world that makes it tractable. Okay, so again, one of the objectives of today is to be able to write everything like this. You know, have curves and push the curves around just to give some intuition. And then later we can do the math if we want. Okay, so we're gonna look at steady state valuations and then we're gonna to try to put the equilibrium. So let me, I'm, gonna write down, I'm gonna write down the four valuation equations. So this may shock you already. It can get even more interesting later on in the course. Okay, but these four equations are the four key equations of the Pissarides model. It assigns a value of being in each of the four states. And if you're a worker, you can only be in two states. And if you're a firm, you can only be in two states. And using that backbone, we can, we can back out pretty much everything, including the Nash bargain wage. Okay, so let's just review them quickly. Um, capital W, the value of having a job in hand. What is it worth? It's worth the one period discounted wage I get at the end of the period, this is a discrete model, discrete time, not continuous time. Okay, so at the end of the period, I get w, little w, that's the wage. Okay, and I discount it by one plus r because there's an interest rate out there. You know what discounting does. And at the end of that period, some news arrives. Either I lose my job for exogenous reasons with probability s, and then I become unemployed. And if I become unemployed, I get value U prime, because U prime does not have to equal U unless we're in a steady state. So this is a, allowing the model to take all sorts of shapes and forms at the beginning, okay? And then W prime would be the value of having the same job, uh, possibly with a different wage, okay? But the worker can't influence it. So I put down steady state valuation equations. The true steady state would be saying big W is equal to W prime. But the lead in would be to say, okay, um, I'm gonna bargain over my little W with my employer, but I can't affect big W prime. It's exogenous to me. The same thing is true for unemployment. If I'm unemployed, I get little B at the end of the period. So I discount it using R. And then what do I get? Okay, so I have a chance of finding a job. We call that F, and if you paid attention to Thomas last week, it's equal to theta times Q. And I just showed that in the yellow highlighted bar. Okay, so the reason I'm doing that is to get rid of stuff I don't want to look at. I don't want to look at F because I can get away with writing theta Q. Fewer things to carry around. Okay, it's the same information. So theta Q is the probability of an unemployed worker which is the same for everyone, of finding a job and employment at value W prime. 
also discounted by little r. Okay? Now, if I'm unsuccessful, then with probability 1 minus little f, i.e. 1 minus theta q, I'm still unemployed. I'm getting u prime. So that kind of describes my situation. Yes? What is r again? It's little r? Interest rate. Yeah. And I have a question. What is the idea behind discounting so leisure by an interest rate? I okay. mean, with the wage, it makes kind of sense. You have purchasing power and interest rate and so on. And Okay, so you're asking an interesting question. Uh, in, in these models we have, we want to look at time. And we want to make it easy for us to understand. So we have discrete time. And then you have to decide when do you get it. Do you get it at the beginning of the period or do you get it at the end of the period? And the, the, what we've done is make everything the same. So B is the monetary value of leisure. It could also be financial. It could be the, the unemployment office gives you a check at the end of the month Ab hat's vier, okay? You get the check. But to make the timing consistent with the wage, again, just for simplicity, we put everything at the end of the period. We could make the, the length of the period go to zero, and we have a continuous time model, and then you'd never ask that question. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a simplifying. You get people on board first, and then you'll, you'll see that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It is important to be clear about it, because you can make little mistakes that can carry through the, the, the rest of the problem. Okay, so does everybody understand the first two sta states? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, the second part is the firm's perspective. Remember, the firm is fighting uh, not necessarily to destroy the workers or to oppress them. They're trying to employ them, but they can't find them. Okay, so the, the idea is if, you're, if you've got a job in hand, you, you've got something. And what do you got? You've got a worker that produces P with you. If you don't have the worker, you can't produce P. And then you have to pay the worker W. So that's your surplus. That's your periodic profit in that particular period, and you discount it using R. Okay, and then at the end of the day, and again, the reason why we have time in this model is because time is the whole point. As soon as you have frictions, things that are coming in the next period matter, but they matter a little bit less than they would if they were happening right now. Okay, so the, the vacancy, um, the, the, uh, the firm's the firm at the end of the period after it's paid its profits faces the same situation uh, that the worker has. For some exogenous reason, the match blows up. Probability S. And 1 minus S, the job survives into the next period and, gets in, and has capitalized value J prime. And that's the capitalized value from the perspective of the beginning of the next period. That's why you discount it by, um, by little r. Okay. So this is what we call a recursive, situ uh, recursive set of equations. And believe me, you can make this extremely complicated, and we will to some extent in this course. But this is a, if you, you really have to invest some time thinking about this way of thinking. Okay, so it's, you know, it's, even if it's the steady state, you still have this dynamic perspective. Things can happen, and they will happen every period. And in this, in this model, the steady state doesn't mean that people aren't still separating from their workers. You can have this level level of water in the bathtub, and it's not changing because inflows and outflows are balanced, but inside that bathtub you have people f flowing in and people flowing out. Jobs flowing in, jobs flowing out. So the firms basically have to discount the possibility of being in the state of vacancy posting, looking for a worker, but not having one in hand, and that's V, capital V, in the next period, V prime. And with probability 1 minus s, the job survives to the next period. So the last state is the, the state where the firms really don't want to be in, which means they're looking for a worker, but they can't make any money. Okay, so think of, the, think of the, all those employers in MITA that are looking for you, but you're, you're not in the market right now. So they're really frustrated. They're complaining to the Chamber of Commerce because there's, you know, there's not enough apprentices, apprentices being trained, etc. That shows up in the last equation in minus c. So the firm is active in the labor market, has to pay C. C is the cost of searching for a worker. That's really important. If C is equal to zero, the model kind of, kind of collapses. The friction is, part of the friction interacts with the fact that firms have to pay something to get something. So the C is an investment. It's a loss in period zero, or in period uh, current. And in the period future, there may be something that happens. And what happens? Well, with probability theta, I get a worker. And I get value of, of having that worker in hand in the next period, and that's J prime. Okay, with one minus um, 
Q, I'm stuck in the vacancy mode for one more period. You can see that's recursive. So if I, if I set capital V equal to V prime, J equal to J, J prime, I get something like a steady state. But we need to do better than that because we have, to, we have to determine W. The wage has to somehow fall out of this model. It's not a very interesting model if I can't let the model tell me how the wage gets determined. Okay, so I need to, I need to show you some more stuff. Okay, and that's the wage bargain. So I'm going to do, I'm going to take you very quickly through this, and Tomas will do it again on Friday. It's basically using the Nash principle, a set of, a set of ideas, to get an, a value of the wage as a function of other stuff in the model. Okay, so when people first started working with this model, they would set wage equal to a constant. In fact, you could set it equal to B. You could say the capitalists were so oppressive, they just paid the workers B, right? And they got all the profits. It's kind of the Marxist version of this, right? Um, that's only a special case in this model. The workers have to be really, really bad off. There must be really high unemployment to enforce that condition. The genius of the Pizzeries model is it allows us an endogenous wage. Even though the wage is exogenous, predetermined from the perspective of the workers, valuing the state, but in fact, little w will be determined endogenously in the model. Okay, so how does this work? This works because of the Nash bargain, and it also occurs because firms are free to enter and post vacancies at zero cost. So entering the model, entering the market doesn't cost anything. If you enter, you have to pay C, and every firm is identical ex ante, so there's no reason for some good firms to hold back or to go first. It's basically, and again, this is another assumption that buys a lot of mileage in this model. So the idea is there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there just sort of waiting, you know, waiting in the, in the wings for this opportunity. As soon as the value of the vacancy, its capitalized value deviates from zero, something will happen. If it's positive, firms will jump into the market post a vacancy, okay, because it's free to do so. Right? And if, if uh, vacancies were to have negative value, then firms would withdraw their vacancies and because they're all the same, it would be like a, the first one out would cause the market uh, to equilibrate. And it's an equilibrium condition for us. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna derive that now. So Nash bargaining, free entry from the perspective of vacancy posting firms, and this market friction are the, are the ingredients to the Pissarides model. So let's, let's, do this in, let's do this very slowly. I'm gonna, first, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you these two curves. Um, to do that, I have to first I have to solve the Nash bargaining problem. Okay, so the again I told you I promised you there'd be two curves. There's one called the UV curve, which is something like you saw with Tomas last week, and the other is the vacancy supply curve, VS, and that's a positively sloped curve. Okay, and their intersection will basically close the Pissarides model. That's how we do this. Okay. Okay, so how do we do this? That's the solution approach. First off, you have an equilibrium. You're going to have some tightness in the market. That's going to determine, it's going to, I'm just going to give you the verbal description. It determines uh, the model's, uh, the worker's wage um, bargaining power. It's going to determine the worker's wage bargaining power. The wage is going to fall out of that. The wage is going to condition the, the willingness of firms to post vacancy. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a, an equilibrium um, in, the, in the sense that we understand from other courses. Okay. So two, two, just to remind you, two endogenous variables that we were going to care about. One is the wage, and the other is um, the vacancy um, unemployment ratio. Okay, so let's start by thinking about the, the Nash bargain. Okay, so th think of some generic worker and some generic firm that don't have employment right now. So the firm comes together and meets the, f uh, the worker and they basically have this surplus that they're gonna share. So what is this surplus? This surplus would be capital W minus capital U. Remember, I already valued out of equilibrium, in equilibrium, what that value would be. So the difference of that is that the value, the capitalized value of the match from the perspective of the worker. And V minus, uh, J minus V is exactly the same uh, concept from the perspective of the firm. How much is the, the existence of this match worth it to me? How much can I, well obviously I can walk away from it, I, I get V again, um, if I 
accept to go into this match and start paying the worker, then I'm going to get um, J. So the difference is the value of the match. You could put those two together. You could think of that as the joint surplus. So W plus J minus U minus V is the joint surplus. So the Nash bargain is taking a geometric mean of those with some value of beta. And in a sense, that's exactly, that's a verbal way of describing, but it really is describe. it's maximizing kind of like a, um, an exponentially weighted average of those two surpluses. And there's only one control variable, that's the little w. So we're sitting here negotiating, and the firm says, hey, you know, um, worker, um, I look out there, I see a lot of unemployed people. I mean, we're going to derive this endogenously, but the w minus u for you is small, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to force you to accept this wage. The worker might say, no, I'm sorry. Um, I've, unemployment's you know, low, or I've got this bargaining power. Well, anyway, this is, all, this is all evident in this model. Everyone knows what the other the other's bargaining position is. So the wage is kind of a deterministic function. There's no, there are no strikes in this model. There are no, there are no, um, there's, there's no mass uh, exploitation or workers organizing or firms organizing. It's all very atomistic to start with. Okay, so if you solve the, the first problem, take the derivative of that thing with respect to little w, remembering that the firms and workers cannot affect w prime and j prime, then the model has a very simple first order condition. And look at it carefully. It says basically the ratio of the surplus for the worker to the ratio of the surplus for the firm is equal to their respective bargaining power. Okay, so if beta is the strength of the worker and beta goes from zero to one, then one minus beta is the firm's power. That's the way the generalized Nash bargain works. Okay, so you can see already that if workers are very powerful in the match for whatever reasons, which is not explained in this model, it's just it's taken as a given. So it could be, it could actually be something like a, some sort of, um, you know, um, union type influence. But we, we leave that. We're going to be silent on what it really is. We're just going to say that it's the workers' bargaining strength. Maybe the workers are just very clever at bargaining. The firms are stupid, or vice versa. Okay, but it's not modeled explicitly. Beta is a parameter of the model. Okay, but look at that beautiful first order condition, right? So you can, you can use that basically to write each of the surpluses as a fraction of the joint surplus. I mean, these are capital values. Okay, and I, this is true even if we don't know what W prime is and U prime. It's the future, and the future, you know, we can't influence it. The first order condition can be read off um, the previous slide, okay? So, insights are very clear. The Nash bargain says fix the proportion of the surplus, okay? And at that point, the wage is almost determined. The only thing we haven't closed the model with is the number of vacancies in the model. So the, the wage will kind of depend on this joint surplus, and the joint surplus will depend on how tight the labor markets are. And that's where Pissarides' uh, model is so clever, because by assuming that firms enter freely, that is going to force big, dub, big V, capital V, the value of being in a vacancy posting mode, to equal to zero. And I'm going to show you that in a few steps, and then in, in the section we'll do it in, in more detail. But the outcome is, is the last line on that slide. So if I set B, big V equal to zero, then I can solve for little w. It's a function of what? It's a function of a bunch of parameters and theta. And theta is endogenous. OK, so the, stare at that. Isn't that just wonderful? Look at that. So the worker's wage in this very simple model is going to depend on the unemployment benefit. OK, that's kind of a no-brainer. The workers have more bargaining power because they know they can get the, if you don't think it's the benefit, think of maybe your mom and dad are going to give you some money, or maybe you have some money under the pillow, whatever enhances your uh, state when you're unemployed. It's also going to depend on your bargaining power. So if your bargaining power is really high, then the weight on the benefit or the income in unemployment becomes less and less. And what becomes stronger is your piece of the action that you get from the firm's profit or the firm's surplus. Okay, so the, 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 remember the firm in, in that instant gets to produce with you P, and the firm is kind of sharing that with you in some sense. 
So the higher the beta is, the more you're going to be earning. So workers who are unionized in this type of model would obviously earn more money. Finally, it depends on theta. So labor market tightness. So the higher theta is, the higher the wage is going to be in this model. Okay, so this is the, this is, you could think of this as the kind of a micro foundation of the Phillips curve maybe, or, or some sort of wage curve in the background. A lot of people have used that. I'm not going to go that far. I'm just going to tell you that um, because of the, the, the friction in the labor market, V over C will determine um, the wage that splits the surplus because the surplus is jointly determined by is determined by B and by P and by C. And think of C as the cost the firms would face if they had to go out and look the next period and the next period and the next period. And we'll show you in a second that's related to um, this C. So it's a so think of these things as the ingredients for the wage equation. Now, how do we get there? I'll show you now in detail. Uh, a couple of slides, just, I'm not going to take you through the math, I'm not going to write it down. Um, first off, we have the first order conditions, okay? And then next we're just going to impose that V equals zero condition. And then I'm going to impose that W is equal to W prime. Okay, so remember the, the workers were sort of looking and searching and the work firms are posting what vacancies, but taking J prime respectively or W prime is given. And in equilibrium, those have to be the same because it's a, it's a steady state. That's how we define the steady states. And it's a, a condition where things are not changing anymore. And that will enable us to solve for all the endogenous variables of the model. Yes? I have a question regarding this free entry condition. Mm -hmm. How do we impose it? Because if V is equal to C or zero, we have to assume many things because if we go back. Not, to not C equals zero, V. That was a val that's, that's the valuation. That's the difference between a valuation and a decision that you're taking. So the, you know, if you have a vacancy out there, you're looking, I can tell you what, it's, what, what your state is worth to you. But then if I tell you it's not so good, you could actually say, well, I don't want to be in that state, so I'm going to pull out. I'm not going to pay C. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, 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 a, it's imposing a constraint on the, on the valid um, values that V would take if it's costless to enter and exit the market as a firm posting a uh, okay. vacancy. That's a key yeah. assumption. It's not costless to post a vacancy, yeah. but it's costless to decide to post an, a vacancy. So that friction is absent, okay? Everybody get that? It's good to ask the questions now because next week we'll do the little bit fancier version. And because right now, look how, look, this model is really kind of stupid. I mean, S is constant, right? And you might think that's not a very good assumption. You might also think that productivity is not constant across workers. So we can, we can make this, but it's not a criticism of Pissarides. It's a criticism, uh, you know, if you take the assumptions too seriously, you might make a few mistakes. But the model is completely logical, right? So impose the, impose the steady state. So W equals W prime, U equals W prime, et cetera. And then you could basically write the capitalized values in the following form. Okay, so you have W minus U is, think of little W minus little B is like the, is like the flow value of having a job relative to being unemployment. And you're, you're kind of discounting it by, it's like an annuity, but now the annuity is based on the interest rate. It's based on the, the, the probability the job is gonna blow up, plus the probability that you could find a job right afterwards. It's like the turnover rate. So a lot of people call that last two terms the turnover in a, in a model. It's like S plus F. Okay, so that's kind, of the, that's kind of like the steady state value of being in work. If the wage is constant, everything is constant. And, um, but wait a second, I told you that V is equal to zero. Okay, so uh, like you were saying, if you just impose that, you get you, these two equations collapse. V is equal to zero means you have two effectively, two ways of establishing what J is, and they have to be equal. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a steady state equilibrium. So, okay, so we put those two together. You eliminate J, and then you just do some substitutions, and you get um, this expression, which is called the VS curve. Okay, so this is a, this is a combination of, the, of solving for the wage, which I um, 
didn't, didn't do, but, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to do. You just plug in the values. And then taking uh, this zero profit condition and setting j uh, in the first equation to j equal the second equation, and you get this condition. And this is like a, it's positively sloped. I'm going to show you that it's positively sloped. Think of this as kind of like a supply curve for vacancies because it's not an individual firm supplying more or less vacancies because that's not the way the model works. It's, a, it's due to entry. So when the conditions are right, more entry occurs, more vacancies are posted, and, um, and the VS curve is positively sloped. So I'm going to, the, the, the VS and the, and the UV curves are in VU space. So if you remember, Tom, uh, Thomas must have showed you the beverage curve. The beverage curve is it's just data. It's vacancies and unemployment, right? You plotted them. You didn't, okay, you will do this. Uh, <laughs> okay. I certainly showed you at the very beginning of this lecture what a beverage curve is. That's an empirical relationship. Pissarides tries to put structure on that. Okay, so uh, you can think of the, 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 U, the UV space and think of how does an economy choose to have a level of unemployment, level of vacancies? It's because of two things happening at the same time. Okay, one is the posting of vacancies, and the other is the steady state for unemployment. So I'm going to take you through that in, in detail now. Okay, so um, if you get good at this, you should be able to derive this VS curve fairly fast. You know, it's just basically taking three equations, plugging it in, and it's, it's um, again, it's, it's, it's about the intuition. But I just take a, if, you, if you stare at this a little bit, you'll see um, the most important intuition that you should see is that theta is the only way that unemployment and vacancies enters into this equation. So employment and vacancies only enter as a ratio. So what do you think that's going to look like in UV space? Okay. Okay, so this is, this is how you get a beverage curve, right? If you go, go, to, go to Fred and get some data, you can plot. And I showed you already, the United States looks like this. Sometimes it shifts, okay? Um, I already told you there's, there are two curves. We're going to draw them in a second. And the one I just described, and it's up here, is the VS curve. So how do you think it looks? You're going to try. Um, the, the, skirt, the beverage curve? No, not the beverage curve, this one. Yeah, it's a ray from the origin. Because it only enter, unemployment only enters in the form V over U. Vacancies only enter in the form V over U. So it's the ratio that matters. The ratio is completely determined by this, by this function. OK, so Vs will be positively sloped. And it's kind of a, it's, in this model, it's really simple. Right? It's a straight line from the origin. And again, by constant returns, you can get really close, and you can still have a reasonably functioning economy. So you can take <laughs> that, that could be Kreuzberg, and this could be Germany. You know, the, the, if you take the model really seriously, the scaling doesn't matter. That's the whole point of constant returns to scale. But the more interesting curve for you, and since Thomas didn't show you the data, he will show you later. I already showed you at the beginning of the lecture this fantastic empirical fact that in most economies over the business cycle, Unemployment and vacancies move in opposite directions. Okay, there's some movement sometimes out, sometimes in, but over the cycle, we have a negative correlation. That's called the beverage curve. And the beverage curve can be explained by um, the interaction of this VS curve with another curve. That's what I'm going to show you right now. And that other curve is easy. So if you're still kind of swimming with all this, this model stuff, this is easy. We did this last time. The UV curve just says, when does unemployment stop changing? It stops changing when the bathtub is level. It's not, not rising or falling. Okay? So it's, it's when the change in unemployment with respect to time is equal to zero. Okay? So you solve for that, and what do you get? You get unemployment is the ratio of the inflow rate to the sum of the inflow rate and the outflow rate. Okay? But we know what f is now. f is equal to theta times q. Okay? So this, this last equation is a relationship of, of the unemployment rate to the ratio of theta, uh, which is the ratio of theta uh, vacancies to unemployment. So that is actually also a relationship. And you can show that has negative slope. So it's going to look like this one. Okay? 
and that's the expression for it. Now remember, theta is equal to v over u, so I just plugged it in. So now you see it explicitly. It's a relationship between u and v. Okay? So there's the bottom line of the Pissarese model is this interaction between the supply of vacancies and the unemployment rate and the relationship between vacancies and unemployment that are consistent with constant unemployment. So this UV curve is kind of mechanical. It's the bathtub. The other one is more fancy. It involves behavior. It involves the firms posting vacancies or not posting them and something happening as a result. So that's the Pissarides model. So now I'd like to show you the why this thing is negatively sloped. So we use, we use math to do that, because if I just told you a story, you wouldn't believe me. Some of you don't believe me already. But that curve is unambiguously negatively sloped, the UV curve. Okay? And we use calculus to do this. It's really simple, assuming you know how to do calculus. Okay? So uh, calculus is asking, like, what happens if you change certain variables by a little bit? What happens to the other ones? It's kind of the no-brainer way of, of des describing it, okay? We also kind of want to show, and I already argued, that the other curve is unambiguously positively sloped. That's not so hard to show. Just mentally, you can see it. it. Theta shows up. I mean, the only way the vacancies and unemployment show up is the ratio. So that's going to be kind of easy to show. Um, so let's, let's try it. Let's see what happens. We want to show... Um, Let's, let's just take that curve very seriously. So the UV curve is U is equal to the inflow rate divided by the outflow rate. The outflow rate is, uh, sorry, S plus the outflow rate. The outflow rate is theta times Q. So I'm just going to massage that a little bit. I'm going to rewrite it in form of X. It's the same idea. The inflows into uh, unemployment on the right-hand side are equal to the outflows out of unemployment on the, right, the left-hand side. Then I take... Then I take a dif I di differentiate, if you like, differentiate um, this equation with respect to u. And if I can get that, if I can get dv du, that is the slope of the uv curve. Okay, so what's the, what's the derivative of this uh, thing with respect to u? And what is the derivative of um, this thing with respect to u? Okay, well, the, the right-hand side is easy. It's just minus s because s is constant. On the right-hand side, x is a function of both u and v, and v is implicitly a function of u. So it's just um, the first partial derivative of x with respect to u and the first partial derivative of x with respect to v times the derivative uh, dv du. Then you solve for dv du. And look at it carefully. It's unambiguously negative. Why? There's a negative sign in front of S. There's a negative sign in front of X sub U, which is positive. So the numerator has to be negative, And the denominator is also positive. So the slope has to be negative. No hocus pocus. You can tell a story, but it makes, it, you know, it makes more sense to do it like this, I mean, I, I think, because then you, can, you don't have to like, tell hocus pocus stories. I mean, you just have, a, you have an answer. I mean, what, what's happening basically in, under the hood is basically unemployment rises. And what happens? The chances of the vacancies of getting posted are higher. Okay, holding everything else constant means that um, for unemployment not to be changing, vacancies have to be lower. Okay, that's just a, it's an equilibrium condition. It's just a way of imposing that things don't move anymore. That's what the UV, UV is a kind of a brainless curve. It's like the bathtub. It's the, but it's not the same thing as the beverage curve. So this could be an exam question. It is not the beverage curve. The beverage curve is the intersection of the two. Because in our, in our minds, this, this is just a model. But what, what, what matters for us is the, is the points we can observe and measure. So if you go to the German Statistisches uh, Bundesamt, you get these numbers for vacancies, and you get these numbers for unemployed people, according to the ILO definition or whatever. And then you can divide by the labor force, and you can actually plot it. Every year, you can plot it. Every quarter, you can, every month, you can plot these numbers. And you can see how they move, right? And that's the, uh, so that's the outcome in the Pissarides world of these two curves shifting. So just make sure you're clear on that. The UV curve is not the beverage curve. The, the beverage curve is the outcome of these endogenous processes. And it could be some other model. I mean, hell, 
but if you want to use the Pissarides model, it's the intersection of those two curves. Okay. So that's a that's a no-brainer, right? Um, and the reason why you're seeing all this is because I've just done a terrible job with the, with the slides. Slide management is very important in my business. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, what about the? You can you can do other stuff. So I, I'm gonna. <clears throat> You can also ask what happens if something else shifts. Okay, so you know this UV curve is kind of describing it's describing the world for a given matching function. So an obvious question to, to ask would be what would happen if the um, if the matching efficiency changed. So suppose the matching function for exogenous reasons became better. So um, if the rate at which people contacted each other in the, in the bathtub changed, suppose it increased. So if, if you read the newspaper, you can think of the, the Hartz reforms. One of the big things about the Hartz reforms um, in 2003 and 2004 was that they tried to improve the efficiency of German employment agencies. So to put things on computers, so the Arbeitsagentur in Kreuzberg could talk to the Arbeitsagentur in, uh, in vetting, and they could exchange information. And then people could be said, well, you've got this job here. You could check that out. And, and there's this vacancy here we found out about. And maybe it's in Bavaria, so you can go to Bavaria if you want. I mean, that, that's the idea. So that could affect, that could affect the, the efficiency of matching. So we don't have that in the model yet, because we just have x. But you could parameterize x. You could write. You could parameterize the efficiency. So you could say, OK, let's let A be some constant. And that's just the, the efficiency of, of matching. If you set it equal to 1, it's just like we had before. But if I say A goes from 1 to 1.5, that means that at any level of vacancies and unemployment, I have 50% more matches per period. Right? So that's an efficiency gain. So you'd ask, OK, well, that must have, that must have an effect on the UV curve. Right? OK? And indeed, it does. Um, and if you, do the, if you do the calculus with this A standing on the outside, you can show that basically, um, you can show that um, DA, uh, DVDA is, is negative. So you can, the, um, holding unemployment constant, um, the number of vacancies you need to get the same uh, steady state is lower. So the curve shifts inward. It's another way of thinking about the, the curve shift. You can also make it, you can think of it in terms of holding vacancies constant. You need fewer unemployed to have a constant level of the bathtub. Okay? So we can use that. We can use that setup to think about all sorts of other stuff. The, the, the Pissarides model consists of, of um, this fundamental assumption about matching. And then it has vacancy posting uh, by firms and entry by firms that is costless. But once having entered, they have to pay C per, per period. Okay? So we could, ask, we could ask the model to tell us what happens if these things change. And that's what we call comparative statics in economics. We do this in a, we do this in a lot of different fields. We, don't, we uh, do it um, in labor as well. So the question is, what parameters change what curves? And let me just finish my sentence. So you can use this already to think about labor market reform. Because again, for me, one of the most important labor market reforms in, in Germany in the past 15 years was the Hartz reforms. And you can think of certain aspects of the Hartz reforms that can map into this setup. And it, it doesn't happen overnight, but things do happen. Wages change, uh, vacancy posting changes, labor market tightness changes, et cetera. Okay. You had a question? Oh, yes. Uh, does this efficiency gain also shift the VS curve? Yes, it does. I just wanted to skip that because we're running out of time. But we can do that. Yeah, definitely. Well, think about it. If, 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 it's, changing, if it's changing the Q function, I mean, it changes the X function, it has to change the Q function. Okay, that's a great, um, 
extension to what we're doing. I think I just did this to, to save time. But the this, this strategy is exactly right. Take a total derivative and solve. Um, it's just a bit, more, a bit more algebra. Okay? So how do we do that? How do we do this? Is, this is, again, using calculus to ask the question, what happens if I change beta? Okay? And changing, like suppose, suppose Germany passed a law that made union organization easy. In fact, actually, we just heard an announcement recently that uh, the, um, the labor minister wants to make it um, make firms be responsible for using subcontracted labor that's being paid less than the minimum wage. So that's, that's clearly increasing workers' bargaining power. So you can tell the story what that would, would do. It would affect wages. It would affect job vacancy posting, like it or not. But maybe we want to have higher wages. I mean, you have to decide yourself as a policymaker. Um, you can think of all the different possible parameters we can change. Again, taking the model seriously in the moment, not necessarily saying this is the model for Germany or for the United States, but it's a start. Okay, so what is the strategy? Let me just tell you the strategy. I'll tell you the answer, and then we can talk about it. Thomas will go through a couple of examples in the, in the section, okay? So the procedure is a three-step procedure. First, you linearize, log-linearize the equations that describe the equilibrium. We have two equations. One is the Vs, the other is the Uv. Okay, so you take a total derivative, and you can set the stuff equal to zero that you don't care about. So that, you know, it's, again, it's a little bit of calculus training. It's like, you know, working out with weights. <laughs> you can do it with little weights and still have big mookies, but you can also do serious stuff and look like a, like a Kuhlschrank, right? <laughs> so the idea, the idea is you want to be able to manipulate, you want to manipulate exogenous factors in the model and look what happens to the curves. And again, it's all about writing the endogenous variables as a function of the exogenous changes. Because we, you know, we know that theta, and theta is actually u and v, and the wage, um, and since, since we know already that we can, we can tell what's happening with the wage just by looking at theta, then we don't need to think about the wage in the first instance. We really just want u and v. That's what makes this Pissaris model so easy to play with. And it's, it's, you know, it's almost seductive, but it does give you some nice insights. Okay? Then you have to solve for the derivative. So I'm, I'm looking for maybe dv d beta. What would an increase in... Uh, the bargaining power for unions due to the posting of vacancies in this model. I'm not saying it's good or bad. We just have to ask the question. What's it going to do to unemployment? Okay, so that's the, that's the value of the Pissarides model. It sorts things out, exogenous influences, endogenous outcomes. Yeah. Short practical question. How is this possible to measure the value of beta bargaining power in which data we can use to measure? Good question, but it can be done. So it's, a, it's subtle. It's something people do for dissertations. You, know, it's a, you can look how wages are a function of things that we think matter. So what matters for wages in this model are things like the fallback position for workers, the productivity of workers, and possibly union. There might be some indirect measurement of union bargaining power. Um, I, I, you know who Bernd Fitzenberger is? You know, yeah. Bernd Fitzenberger, one of our colleagues here. Yeah, sure. Okay, so he and I have a paper. We actually tried, we know for a fact that in Germany, there are three different types of union contracts. One is nationwide, the other is uh, industry-wide, and the other is no contract at all. Okay, the model predicts clearly that, the model predicts that workers that have, a, have an industry contract will get higher wages than those in a, in a national contract. Okay, because it's kind of risk sharing and other stuff. Um, but to show that um, means you have to look at the entire distribution of wages. Okay, so that's kind of a that's kind of one way of getting at it indirectly. But you can also ask you can ask people, are you a member of a union? Is your union a, a union contract? So you already get cross country evidence. Like in Germany, the coverage of workers' wages by union negotiated contracts is probably about two thirds, and in Sweden it's maybe eighty or ninety percent. In France, it's also very high. So there are indirect measurements. But you're right. Um, to do it really properly, you have to use econometrics, maybe estimate some wage equations. All right, so my last. So we, we do this, comparative statics. We can actually formally show what this picture is showing. Okay, So the, um, I'm going to look at some changes. I'm not going to look at 
change in A, because A would actually shift the UV curve as well. It gets more complicated. We can do that maybe in the next class when we talk about the mortensen pissarides model. But you can see that the model already generates some pretty interesting predictions. OK, so what are they? If P goes up, the match in the model is more valuable, right? From the perspective of the firm as well as the worker. OK, so the, the VS curve rotates in a counterclockwise direction. What do you see as a result? Unemployment falls and vacancies rise. OK, so it's kind of a, you'd expect that. But tell the story. How does it happen? You come into a match with a worker. Um, you're a firm. The firm, I really want this worker because P is really high now. I can make lots of money. But the worker knows that, so the worker asks for a higher wage. I'm posting lots of vacancies. All the, 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 the firms that aren't yet with workers are posting vacancies, so that increases labor market tightness. Okay, and that keeps happening until the wage is pushing the, the envelope and becomes less interesting for the workers, uh, for the firms to hire the workers because a lot of their profits going to the workers' wage. Okay, so that's, you know, and if that doesn't happen, you can imagine that people keep posting vacancies, you know, without, without end, and that's kind of one interpretation of what's happening right now in Germany. Wages aren't rising very much for whatever reasons. And firms are posting lots of vacancies. If you look at the data, it's quite impressive. And firms are complaining they can't find workers. So the model is really powerful. Um, it also suggests that if, if things go south, um, unemployment's going to rise and vacancies are going to fall. It could also happen because you, know, you raise the worker's bargaining power. If you pay the worker more income and unemployment, so if you raise the benefit, Again, that's one of the things we have to worry about. If we like, if we like the distribu distributional consequences, fine. But the model predicts it's going to have an, a negative influence on unemployment. And the same is true of, um, of the cost of posting vacancies. So this is kind of the value of comparative statics. It gives us a kind of a compass to, to read uh, the expected effect. And again, in, in the real world, things are happening. Lots of things are happening at the same time. So we have to be careful. We don't want to take this model as like religion, but it's kind of a nice starting position. And you can you kind of get some ideas about why the Hartz reforms might have been successful. The Hartz reforms did not weaken unions too much, but they certainly reduced benefit. Okay, so that that would have that causes wages to to be lower. It also causes firms to post a lot more vacancies. I guess that's a nice interpretation, uh, and also the. You can tell all these different stories. So it's, it's kind of a formalized version of, of storytelling. We want to do better than that. And we'll do that next week when we talk about the mortensen pissarides model, which is when Mortensen and Pissarides came together. It's like an explosion. <laughs> OK, see you. <laughs>